Hi, I'm Pastor Don Cherry of the Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church in Stevens City, Virginia. And we're glad that you've chosen to join us this morning for our worship service. We're hoping that it'll be a blessing to you, be an encouragement to you, and even a little bit of a challenge to you as we look into the Word of God together. So I hope that you'll follow us, have your Bible out, and all join in with us and join us as we go into the Word of God this morning. May it be a blessing to you. A couple of weeks ago, I met a young man named Brian Blake and all and his wife at uh, First Baptist Church there in Inwood, where I attend there on Sunday evenings. And uh, I got to tell you where I was sitting, him and his wife came and sat on the front row there, and I thought, man, they're getting their teenagers to move down front. And then come to find out, him and his wife were missionaries, and all over to Netherlands, Netherlands right, and, all, and uh, gave a wonderful presentation, uh, some testimony there. And uh, they're back in the area, and so I asked Brian to come and just share with us as we're continuing to grow our mission uh, ministry here and, and um, move forward with that, and just let you hear his heart about this just for a few minutes and such. So Brian, come and introduce yourself, and um, also I think y'all are staying in Ohio, right? Yes. Amen. <laughs> Good place to be from. All right, go right ahead. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Like I said, I'm Brian. Joanna's not with me today. Uh, she's still in Ohio right now uh, because I came up this weekend uh, because her brother's getting married this summer, um, and I'm a part of the party, so I went to a bachelor party this weekend, uh, kind of in Pennsylvania, so I'm in the area. She wasn't invited, uh, so uh, it's just me, so... Sorry about that. Um, but I'm just going to share a little bit about my story and what has led me to the mission. Um, and then I'll also share a little bit about our mission. Uh, and so to begin off, uh, I grew up in somewhat of a broken household where my parents got divorced when I was two. Uh, and then they got remarried fairly early on. Uh, but because of that, I had some parents who knew the Lord and some who didn't. Um, and that really kind of transformed my heart in that season. I, I didn't know what to believe. I was in and out of different churches, going to different churches on different Sundays. Um, so I never really had a relationship with the Lord growing up. Um, near the end of my high school career, I said, yeah, like, I, I like church. I like the friends that I've made and the people I belong with. Um, but that's about it. So when I went to Bowling Green, uh, the university I attended, um, I found my a ministry there. I found a, f a family, a group of people uh, that were like me, that liked to do things that I did. Um, but that was pretty much all I was going there for. So a year goes by, and... I enjoyed, I made friends, um, and that was pretty much it. And then my sophomore year comes around, and they invited me to go on a mission trip. And I said, sure. Like, I've been on mission trips before. Um, it's fun. I get to travel. I get to serve a community. Um, and so I signed up for this one. But this mission trip was a little bit different. So we went to Panama City Beach, Florida, to share the gospel with Spring Breakers. And so I found myself sitting face to face with a stranger, trying to tell them about Jesus. And I realized I knew nothing about him. I didn't know who Jesus was, what he did, what he could mean to them, let alone what he meant to me. And that would shock me at that time because I would have said I was a Christian. And so I left that mission trip really reflecting, even praying, asking the Lord, what is this? What is this thing I've surrounded myself with? Like, what, what am I even trying to do? And the Lord so gracefully welcomed me home and said, Brian, I want a relationship with you. I want you to know who I am and what I've done for you. I want you to know what that means for your life and for your forever. And so I accepted Christ in my life my sophomore year of college. And from there, my life kind of transformed. Um, I started serving in that church that I was a part of. Um, and through opportunities to serve, I was just talking to some people about international ministry. And they were telling me about these places in Asia, these towns in Africa who've never heard the gospel before. And I think my young Christian heart like, couldn't relate with that mission. And I said, that's sweet, but like, what about the places who have heard the gospel and said no to it? or like these post-Christian worlds. Because I felt like when I was growing up, people assumed I was fine, but I wasn't. And I feel like that was a target market that a lot of people were missing. And so I said, well, what about Europe? And they looked at me and said, yeah, like that's a place, definitely be praying for them, but that's not where our heart's at. And so I took that very literally. I started praying for Europe. I started praying that the Lord would send people out there for people to come to know who Jesus is and for there to be like a mini revolution for his name there. And so I did that through the rest of my college career and found myself in like this discipleship program out in Colorado in a summer. Um, and then I, I found myself serving at a local church out there. 
Uh, and I was just talking to the lead pastor of the church about my heart for Europe. And he looked at me and said, man, that's awesome. I'm so glad you're passionate about that. Like, have you ever thought about going yourself? And I looked at him and like reflected on like the three years of praying about it and said, no, uh, I'm a sport management major. I, I just graduated. I'm already applying for jobs. Like, wh why would I go out there? Um, and he, he kind of just left that with me. And so I, I went back to my room that evening and started praying. I, I said, Lord, what is this heart you give me? Is it a heart of, of wanting people to go or are you preparing my heart to go? Uh, and through prayer and discernment, I said, Lord, I'm willing to go. If, if this is of your will, open doors and I'll follow. And sure enough, two weeks later, I got introduced to Caleb and Don Chrisman, who are planning a church in the Netherlands. Uh, getting to know about their story and what they're about, I said, yes, like this is the ministry I want to be a part of. And so I put those job applications on hold. I started pursuing this. Two months into doing it, uh, COVID hit. And so that stopped everything. Uh, and so I found myself working in the Target area, uh, or the Bainbridge area of Ohio at Target, trying to pay off student loans until I could go to the Netherlands. Um, and that's where I found my wife. Uh, and through opportunities to serve together, uh, through dating and now in marriage, uh, we've gotten to see how the Lord is moving in our hearts. My wife's not here today, so she can't share this. Uh, but her first year in Ohio, she's from West Virginia, her first year in Ohio was tough for her. Uh, she didn't feel like she had community. She didn't feel like she belonged. She was asking the Lord why she brought, or he brought her out there. Um, and through opportunity to serve together um, and be a part of the church that we are there locally, she realized that the Lord was preparing her for a bigger move. Not just to Ohio, not just to marry me, but for a bigger move in the Netherlands. And that excites us going forward uh, because we believe that the Lord can really do amazing things out in the Netherlands um, and really meet these students. Uh, that are a little bit lost, right? Um, so a little bit about our ministry, that's a little bit about myself. Um, the ministry that we are being, I guess, planting out in the Netherlands will be at Delft University. Delft is near Amsterdam, uh, fairly close, about 45 minute train ride. Um, and out there, this, this tech, uh, business technology university, um, roughly 3% of them would declare that they are Christians. So there's 23,000 students there. That means 900 of them would say that they're Christians. And so there's a large majority of people that really need the gospel. There's not a great representation of the gospel out there because there's very few churches in the area. Ever since World War II, um, Christianity has been dying off to where it's about 1% as a country in whole. So the university is slightly higher than the country. Um, and so that's where we feel like we can come in, that we can be a church for these students. We want to be on campus with these students. Obviously, early on, there's not like a physical church there that we'll have. It'll just be missionaries. And so we want to start small. We want to build relationships with these students, really get to know them, and through this relationship, share the gospel. And then once people truly understand who Jesus is and they want, yes, like I want to follow Jesus, then we want to walk alongside of them and learn what that looks like to do it together in community. And once that happens and more people kind of come to know who Jesus is, then we want to be an actual church. We want to meet up in small groups, Bible studies. We want to have a larger worship service. And all of this is going to take place on campus at the university. So they don't have to leave campus to go to a church, but actually know that their church family is there on the university. And so we'll be meeting up in like lecture halls and stuff like that to do those sort of things. And then our heart is truly to see more people come to know Jesus. And so we want to plant more churches out there at other universities across Europe. And for that to happen, there needs to be a true heart for the lost. And so we want to see and learn what it looks like to be disciples, but we want to disciple people who actually want to disciple, right? And so we don't want this just to be an opportunity where people come to know Jesus, but also share that good news with other people. Because we're with these students for three, maybe four years, and then they're gone, right? Most of them will either go back home or go to a different like country to live. And our heart is that they come to know who Jesus is and then they move out to another country and get to share that good news. And so that's gonna be a little bit about our ministry. Uh, we did uh, partner with a couple organizations to get out there and I'd love to share more about that at another time. But I do have some prayer cards out there that tells you a little bit about us. It also shows you how you can get connected. Um, and I also put index cards out there. Um, because what we're looking for is support. Uh, not only when I say support, most of you are like, all right, he wants money. And, you know, a little bit, you know, I need to be able to live out there. But the amount that we're raising not only goes to our, our living expenses out there, uh, like our food and our rent, all that, but it also goes towards our ministry expenses because we're at a college, so we never really expect there to be enough tithing to support a church. And so we're raising up support for that. 
Uh, but we're also uh, looking for prayer partners, and we're also looking for connections. I mean, the reason I'm here today is because I truly have a heart and passion for as many people to know about the need out in the Netherlands. Shocking that only 3% of people would say that they're Christians. We think of Europe and that they're fine, but in all reality, they need Jesus just as badly as we do here. And so I'm here to share that with you and really invite you into that ministry. And so I'd love to be connected with you. If you're at all interested in it, like I don't want you just to sign up for our newsletter and then never hear from me. Like I really want you to be a part of this ministry as much as you can where you're at in this, uh, in, uh, here in the United States. And so if you want to put like an email down, a phone number, I'd love to contact you. Make sure you put your name too, uh, because some people forget to do that. And then I'm awkwardly reaching out and be like, hey, so-and-so. Um, and so, yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be around after the service. But there's a table out there that's got a prayer card. Please grab one of those. Be praying for us. Uh, we need it so desperately for those hearts to be open out there to receive the gospel. Um, and then also during this season, as Joanne and I are support raising, uh, because it's, it's an emotional toll that it kind of takes out on us. So, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to see me after the service. Awesome. Good to see young people that will give themselves I and mean, be willing to go and share the gospel with those in other countries. And all that I um, appreciate the ministry if they have. This morning, I'd like for you to take your Bibles and go to Revelation chapter 19, if you would. We have been in a series trying to. Um, I guess you could say bounce off of the Sunday school uh, series that we've had with Dr. David Jeremiah, you know, where do we go from here? Of course, he was dealing with many prophetic events and everything and how we're seeing uh, those uh, prophecies, you know, make their way into our culture, into our world today and seeing the fulfillment of that. And so basically, uh, the message series that we've had is the believer's hope from the rapture to the millennium. And basically what we're doing is, as believers, so what do we have to look forward to? Of course, the Bible teaches that the next great event that is going to take place is the rapture of the church, okay? The rapture of the believers. Now, we don't know anything leading up to that. Because unlike the second coming of Christ, where Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 said, um, uh, there are all these things for you to be looking for, you know, prior to my second coming, we don't see those in indicators when it comes to the rapture. But here's the neat thing about that. Those things, many of those things that Jesus said to look forward to when it comes to the second coming of Christ, we are seeing some of those take place even now, and all which is seven years prior to that happening. So how close are we to the rapture of the church? All right? So that is the next event that we, we as believers will look forward to. Last week, we dealt with the judgment seat of Christ, which the Bible says, you know what? We're all going to appear there, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Listen to me, folks. You're a saved child of God and everything. You're going to be at that appointment. I want you to understand that. You're not going to be able to call and say, hey, Lord, I can't make it today. You know, you're not going to be able to change the date on that. We're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And the Bible says, give account okay, of our lives while we're here on this earth. Well, the next great uh, thing that's going to happen there in heaven and all is what's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb that the church, who is the bride of Christ, and all we're going to be involved in this great celebration and all that the Bible talks about here in Revelation chapter 19. So if you have your Bibles open there this morning, we're going to begin in verse 7. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice. Wasn't that kind of the first song that we sang this morning? And all, I will rejoice and all be glad, all that good stuff. So here we go. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now verse 10. 
And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am your fellow servant. And of thy brethren that had the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The marriage supper of the Lamb. You know, marriage comes in all different shapes and sizes, doesn't it? My wife and I are going to celebrate 47 years next month on the 23rd of, 23rd of May. And by the way, just so you all know, she loves chocolate, okay? So you all just keep that in mind with that. But um, uh, uh, different shapes and sizes, you know, from ceremonies at the Justice of the Peace to the elaborate ceremony, if you remember when Princess Di and um, Prince Charles got married. I mean, I mean that was just like a, a, a blockbuster, you know, for that, going, you know, from one, one to the other. Um, how many of you remember, and not too long ago, there was a show on television called Two Broke Girls. Y'all remember that show? And if you have a couple of you remember that? Well, Deb and I were two broke college kids. Everything. We got married after our second year in college, and all right after the graduation day took place. So those who were there were primarily our family and a few of our friends that were willing to stay an extra day. And it didn't help the fact that we got married in Springfield, Missouri, which I'm from Ohio. She's from New Mexico, so we were in a neutral spot for sure. But um, we think when I when I go back to it, and I know she can remember. Um, our wedding was interesting. That's the only way to say about it. Um, the fellow who was supposed to do the music was my piano teacher and all there at college, but uh, he didn't get there until about five minutes before time and everything. He'd got stuck in traffic. I can't remember what it was. So he got there just in time to, dun, 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 you know, for my wife to come walking down. And then during the ceremony, when I saw Deb walking down the aisle and everything, my mind just went blank. You know, of course, the first thought was, Don, what are you doing? But no, just kidding. But my mind just totally went blank. And during the service, there was a couple times I leaned over to Deb and said, what do we do? I lost it. It was gone. And she'd have to say, go here, go there, you know, and direct me through that. And then um, I guess to top it off, there's a couple girls that had to go there in the back and everything um, to hold the cake up because it started doing a leaning tower a piece of thing. You know, so they had to go and hold that thing up and all and get all that. But nonetheless, and other thing, we got married and all. We went on a honeymoon to Branson, Missouri. Anybody ever been to Branson, Missouri? Y'all been to Branson? Okay. Well, when we went and everything, Branson was one stoplight and three dogs. I mean, that's all that was there. It's a huge entertainment place now. I mean, it's a great place to go, but there wasn't nothing there, you know, when we, when we were there back then. And uh, so we, we had our three-day honeymoon. I had to be back to work on, uh, on a Tuesday, and we came back with $12 in our pocket, which that was all the money we had to our name and all, but um, wouldn't trade it for a thing. The only thing I've ever told people and everything is I had, if I had to do all over again, I would have married the same girl. I would have just waited. Because I wasn't ready. And from a maturity standpoint, everything, I, there, I had some growing up to do, everything, but I definitely married the same girl, everything. So um, maybe you can remember some things of your own marriage and all. And all. Maybe you've been to those elaborate weddings, like, oh my goodness, you know, this is something. Look how they've got this decked out. Look at how many people are here and all that good stuff. Well, let me tell you something, folks. Probably the greatest marriage that you could imagine of this world doesn't hold a candle to what we're going to participate in when we get to heaven. The marriage supper of the Lamb, the bride of Christ. Who is the bride of Christ? The church, the New Testament church. Those who have been saved during this New Testament era and everything comprise the bride of Christ, you see. And so we're going to be there. We're going to be caught up. We're going to meet him, and we're going to get ready for that. But as I go through, um, as I go through this thing, I want you to kind of tie in what Christ did in our behalf. Because what we're basically describing is a Jewish wedding ceremony, okay? A Jewish wedding ceremony, and particularly the Old Testament. And you can find it, you know, even more, maybe a little detail when you go back to when Isaac 
when he was looking for his bride and how that turned out to be. Now, I don't know how the Jewish people do it today. You probably have talked to Eric a little bit and everything, but I know when you go back in the Old Testament time and the early New Covenant and all, they had a format that you followed, but this is a tremendous uh, uh, thing that we're going to look at, and I think you'll see the tie, to, tie together of what Christ has done for us. So let's kind of go through this a little bit. And all, and keep in mind that in in the ancient Jewish times and all, they had what was called a betrothal process. Okay, you might be familiar with that, right? Now, betrothal is a little bit more than what our engagement process is. Okay, a betrothal was often arranged by the parents. Okay, and even when the children were just born. One family, two families got together and say, my son's marrying your daughter, and they, they made that agreement and all. But nonetheless, and all, um, uh, of course, there was that time when they did have the ceremony, and usually in most Jewish weddings back then, and all, um, boys and girls were married by the time they were 18. By the time they were 18, even some, uh, especially the girls as young as 13 and all, were wed. Okay, we're wed through this. Matter of fact, there are many Bible teachers and commentaries that believe that Jesus' mother Mary was probably 13, 14 years old. Everything when she gave birth to the Messiah. You know, that was just what took place in Jewish culture. So first of all, what I want you to understand here is that the bride was chosen by the groom's father. Okay, so I want you to get that down. The bride was chosen by by the bridegroom's father, okay? Now, I want you to think of that. And everything. Well, who is the bride? The church, the New Testament church, okay? How have we become the New Testament church? Through faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and we need to understand that we are chosen in God, all right? Now, yes, we have, we have a part of that and everything. We have that free will to accept or reject and everything, but God makes the offer, Okay, to come in, to be born again, to be in his family. And the Bible also says that, uh, that faith comes by what? Hearing, hearing by the word of God. So with that, what I want you to understand is nobody gets up one day and just, oh, you know what, I think I'll get saved today. No, there must be the hearing of the word of God. There must be the convicting of the Holy Spirit and everything. And those who accept God's offer in that way are chosen. Okay, so in such way, the father has chosen the bride for the bridegroom, all right? This is following right along with just Jewish uh, uh, culture right here. So the bride is chosen by the father. Then next what takes place is a price is paid, okay? A price is paid for the bride. Now, why is that? Well, keep in mind and everything, that daughter was a valuable asset to the family. Now, unlike families today, unless you're maybe into farming or, or, or whatever like that, you know, most of the time you have families, and families go different directions, even from under one roof. Dad goes to work, mom goes to work, kids go here, kids go there, and such like that. Well, in that Jewish culture, they work together as families. The mother and the daughters and all worked around the home, worked out into the field and all if needed to. And of course, the fathers and sons were there. So when a daughter was betrothed, okay, to be married, when she was going to be leaving this family and joining her bride, her bridegroom's family, listen, there had to be some some compensation here, and so a price was paid for this girl to come and be part of. This family, all right? Now, what does the Bible teach us? Doesn't the Bible teach us that a price has been paid for us, for our salvation? You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that we are bought with a price, okay? We are bought with a price. What is that price? The Bible tells us we are not redeemed by corruptible things, but by the blood of Christ. That was the price that was paid for you and I. Now, I do want to say this in the Oftentimes that verse that we were bought with a price, we tend to stop right there. We don't go any farther. But you need to follow that verse through because after that, the Bible says that you are not your own. In other words, as a child of God to sit back and say, it's my life, I'm going to do with it what I want to. Listen, you're going to have to come up with some scripture other than 1 Corinthians chapter 6 as the Bible says that no, if you were bought with a price, if you were a child of God, you are not your own. 
The only thing we can do as children of God is sit back and say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Because we belong to him. Do you understand that this morning? We belong to him, don't we? You've all, every one of us have bought things at our home. We bought our home. We bought our car. We bought our snowblower. We bought our mower. We bought whatever like that. You bought that. You paid the price. Well, whose is it? If you bought it, whose is it? It's yours, right? And you know what? You can do with it what you want. I had to borrow my uh, neighbor's mower yesterday because mine died after about 15 years and such. And so I borrowed his to finish my lawn, you know. Well, that's not my mower. So I didn't have a right to do with that mower what I wanted. Now, I can take my mower, and if I want to load it up in the trunk and throw it in the junkyard, you know, that's fine. You know why? Because it's mine, you see. But I don't have a right to do what I want to do with somebody else's possession. Folks, we need to understand we belong to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Do we get that? Does everybody get that this morning? You see where I'm coming from? We sit back and it's not say, Lord, this is my life. I'll do with it what I want. No, 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 no. This is God's life. This is Christ's life. You know why? Because he paid the price for you. He shed his blood for you. So a price was paid in that. Let's move on. Then after that price was paid, the bridegroom prepares his home in the father's house. He goes back to his father's house. And he prepares a place for him and his bride to stay. Folks, I don't know about you, but have you thought about John chapter 14 for a minute? Where Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will what? Come again and do what? Receive you unto myself. Man, listen, the Lord, what he has done, he's just following the, you know, what was said all the way back in Genesis, you see. When we look at this Jewish wedding pattern here, he's following all things. And by the way, allow me to say this. In our culture today, we are seeing a lot of turning against the nation of Israel. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you the nation of Israel is godly or that they're living perfect lives or anything like that. But God made a covenant with them, and God's covenant is still in force. And we need to understand in Genesis chapter 12, I will bless them that bless thee, I will curse them that curse thee. As believers and all, we need to stand side by side the nation of Israel. We need to stand side by side. You know. They are God's chosen people as far as this earth goes. And as I've told you many times before, when Jesus does return, he doesn't come to New York City, he doesn't come to Dallas, Texas, he doesn't come to Paris. He comes to Jerusalem, and there's where he sets up his kingdom, all right? So I just wanted to say that so that you'll understand this. So after that price is paid, the bride, of course, remains, but the bridegroom goes off to his father's house to prepare the place for her. Now, here's the thing, and here's the other thing. The bride prepares for his return, although she doesn't know when it's going to happen. He's, he doesn't tell her, hey, listen, I'll be back on the 10th of next month. He doesn't say, I'll be back in six months. He, de he doesn't tell her when, because he doesn't know. He doesn't know how long it's going to take him to finish that place. It may take a month. It might take six months. It might take a year, you see. But he's preparing that place for his bride, you see. He's preparing the bridegroom, or the bride, uh, excuse me, the bride does not know when he's going to return, but she keeps herself ready. She continues in her work. She continues in her labors and such as like that, but she's listening. She's waiting because she knows at any time her bridegroom is going to return. What's the message to you? Since we are the bride and we see here that the bride, she remains active. She continues to, 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 to do the duties that are before her. What does that tell you and I as the church? We need to continue to do the work of the church. We need to be busy about doing the Lord's work. What is that? Going into all the world, proclaiming the gospel, and all baptizing them, teaching them until the Lord returns, you see. That's why we're here, folks. We're not here to make you comfortable. We're not here to sing the songs you like. We're not here and all to preach the messages that will tickle your ear and figure out. No, we have a job to do as the church, and that is to leave this place and to be salt and to be light so that others can know of Christ. Wherever it might be, 
whoever you might come across, you see. And listen, I'm, I'm too old to not be honest with you and everything. Look, I don't care what your age is. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. God has a plan and God has a purpose for your life, and that is to continue until he takes you home. Maybe you can't get out and knock doors. Maybe you can't get out and build a bus route. Maybe you can't get out and run after children all over the gym or whatever. Like, Maybe you can't do that thing. But you sit back and say, God, what would you have me to do? God will reveal that and do so. Be faithful until the Lord calls you home. I don't find anywhere in Scripture where it says, hey, you're 65 years old, go fishing. I don't see that. Be faithful. Be faithful what God has called you to do. Now, here's something really cool. So when the bridegroom finishes that place, him and his entourage, and that depends on the family he was from. Maybe it's just him. Small family, he's got maybe a couple of attendants with him. He's from a huge family. He might have more. But what he does now is he makes his way to where the bride's at, okay? Okay? And when he gets on the outskirts, when he gets on the edge of the community there, one of the entourage blows a trumpet and shouts, the bridegroom comes. Where have you heard that before? Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The last trump, the shout, you see. The Bible tells you, you see how this is following? You see what we're seeing here? Everything in this basically Jewish wedding ceremony, we have seen what Christ has done for his bride and how he's going to return to bring her where he's at. And so when the bride hears that trumpet, hears that sound, she's ready to go. She's got her bags packed and everything. It's not, oh, oh, hey, you know, like most women are today, just give me a half an hour. No, that's not going to happen you got to be ready to go. Because after all, the Bible does say when that takes place, what happens in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be with the Lord, you see. But here's the thing. Are you listening? Are you listening this morning? Are you preparing yourself? Are you expectant? Because here's the thing. We don't know, do we? The Lord did not give us a date. He did not say, hey, Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church, I'll be back on July 4th, 2022. He didn't say that. He just said he was going to come back. And we have to be ready. Just like the bride had to be ready to hear the shout and the voice. Now, next. The bridegroom now receives his bride. And he returns to the father's house for the wedding consummation. And the, seven day, and, the, and the celebration. So here's the question. Does anybody have any idea? And Eric, you can't answer this. Does anybody have the idea how long this Jewish wedding and ceremony took place? It takes place seven days. It's one week. Where have you heard that? Go to the book of Daniel. Daniel's 70th week, what's it talking about? It's talking about the tribulation period, which does describe most marriages today. But anyway, you know, you got, you got this tribulation period that's taking place here on the earth. While in heaven, the church, the bride, and the bridegroom are celebrating. Celebrating, you see. One week, one uh, seven-year period. Then once that is over, Now the church is forever together with Christ, you see. There's things to take place after that, and we'll deal with those over the next couple weeks. But I want you to see here this, because we're going to be part of this. I mentioned a couple weeks ago that you and I, we're going to be part of the judgment seat of Christ, amen? We must all appear. We must all give account as a child of God. Nobody's going to get out of that appointment, okay? This is something we're, we're going to participate in. We're also going to participate in the marriage of the Lamb, okay? Participate in that ceremony and the bride and the bridegroom forever together, you see. And that's when you get into Revelation 21 and 22 and you see all those things. So here's what I'm talking about, friends. Here's what I'm talking about. 
The main word, I guess you could say, of this message series has been hope. Has been hope. Where does your hope lie today? What do you find hope in? What do you find hope in when you look around this world? You know, what are the people of Ukraine, where are they finding their hope today? What about other countries where there's civil uh, disturbances? Where, where are they finding hope today? We're even hearing people in America, you know, I've, a couple of uh, individuals that I've worked with and everything, even they're at Lowe's that I've worked with and everything, going through the stress of the day. And they make the statement, say, I can't wait to get home and start drinking. Where are they finding hope today? Folks, you and I have hope in Christ. We have something to look forward to, you see. But until then, until then, are we faithful to the calling of God today? Are we faithful in our individual lives? Are we faithful as a church, as a body? Because as long as we're still here, guess what? The Great Commission is still in force. And that is to you and that is to me and that is to go into the world and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the message. That's just like what Brian was talking about. and the thing. I've been over in Europe. I know, you know, we might think Europe is the cradle of Christianity in some ways. But if you go over there today, you go to England, you go to Wales, you go to uh, probably the Netherlands, other places like that, you will see church buildings, church buildings that have been turned into restaurants, been turned into skating rinks, been turned into shopping malls. Because they're not. And on any given time, maybe only 1% of the population in church on any given Sunday. You see, we don't think of that as a mission field, but yet it is. Sometimes we don't think of America as a mission field, but believe me, it is. Believe me, it is. And guess what? We have the message that's needed. Are we going to be faithful with that message? Let's bow our heads, please, if you would. Heads. Well, folks, thanks for joining us in our live stream here from Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church in Stephen City, Virginia. And I trust that the message was an encouragement to your heart today. If you'd like to find out more about that ministry, or, you know, if there's something we can pray for you about or a spiritual question that we can answer, I want to encourage you to go to our website at svbcfamily.com. That's for Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church family.com. And just follow the prompts there and you can send your prayer request. You can send your question and everything. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. But as always, you're welcome to join us any Sunday at 1030 a.m. right here in uh, Stevens City, located right between Route 11 and I-81. So uh, come and see us sometime. But until then, I pray the Lord bless you. I pray the Lord keep you and that the Lord shine his face upon you.